A low pass filter is a spectral effect where the low frequencies of our input signal pass through without being reduced in amplitude, but the high frequencies of our input signal are filtered out or reduced in amplitude. One way to create a basic low pass filter is to use parallel processing, where one path is our dry input signal and our parallel path introduces one sample of delay. For low frequencies, when we combine these two paths together, we're going to create constructive interference. But for high frequencies, when we add these two paths together, it actually creates destructive interference to reduce the amplitude of the high frequencies. So let's switch over to MATLAB and look at how we can implement this basic low pass filter and also analyze it. Here in MATLAB, I've started this script called Basic Filter that I'll use to demonstrate how we can set up and perform spectral processing. First thing I'm gonna do is create an input signal that we can uh, use to analyze the processing. So in terms of listening to the result, type of signal that we can use is white noise. This signal has the potential for energy at frequencies all across the spectrum from low frequencies to high frequencies. So we can hear what happens to the low frequencies, what happens to the high frequencies when they're going to be processed by our spectral filter here. So to set this up, just put in some sampling rate that we use with audio, 48,000, and create our input signal, we'll call it X. And we'll use this built-in function rand in, and we need some number of samples. Let's call that big N comma one. And so we'll say N is equal to uh, one second times our sampling rate. So big N is our number of samples in our signal, and X is our actual input signal. That's noise. Uh, so this is great. Now what we can do is set up a loop to actually process our uh, input signal to create the output signal. So I'll set up a loop. Here it's going to be four. We'll go through each sample. We'll call each sample lowercase n equal to one through how many number of samples we have. That's big N. So here's our end of our loop. And inside of the loop, we're gonna perform processing. First way we'll look at doing this is to add together a dry version of our input signal at the current time sample. So that'll be x of n comma one. And what we're gonna do is add to it one sample from the past, the previous sample. And so that's gonna be a delayed version, which is n minus one. So there's how we are going to add together the two samples and we'll assign that to our output. So we'll need to index that one as well in comma one. Now this works great for almost all the samples in our signal, except what happens at the beginning. So when lowercase n is equal to one, we'd be indexing here a value of zero. We can't index zero. So what I'm gonna do for now is just set up some conditional that says if n is equal to one, then we're just gonna have our output like this, where we don't add together the previous sample, it just adds the current sample, and we'll do else. And this is the uh, one that happens for the other cases. So this way, we're setting it up for all the samples except for the first one. We're gonna be adding together the current sample and one from the past. So I'm gonna initialize Y here to be zeros so that um, it's not growing every time through the loop. That's great. All right, so this will actually perform our processing. So maybe what we wanna do is listen to the result. So hear this happening. I'll say sound of Y comma FS for our sampling rate. Here, I'll run the script and we can listen to the result of processing the white noise. So it's a very subtle form of processing, uh, difficult to hear. What I'll do is play them back and forth. We can listen to our original unprocessed signal X and we'll listen to that compared to Y. What we'll hear is there's a slight boost in the amplitude at low frequencies and a reduction in the amplitude at high frequencies.
So there's another way that we can set up this processing inside of our loop. And I'll demonstrate that next before we move on and look at how we can actually analyze this processing that's taking place. So right now we've got it set up that we are actually indexing X as part of our signal that we're going to use. Instead of doing that, I'm gonna set up a new variable. And this one is gonna be called the previous sample. Initially, I'm gonna set it to zero and we'll update it each time through our loop. So if you think about the concept of our processing, what we really want to do is add together X plus the previous sample. So the first time through our loop, when lowercase n is equal to one, this previous sample is zero. So that's fine, we've initialized it to have a value. That's great. The next time through the loop, what we want to do is update this so it's x of n comma one. Now think about the value that previous sample takes each time through the loop. Initially it has a value of zero. So we add our current sample plus zero. Then what we do is we take the first one, so sample number one of x, take sample number one of x and we put it into previous sample. Then we start the loop over again and now we're on sample number two. So we take x of sample number two and we add it with previous sample, which is sample number one. So this is a clever way that we can set it up to do the processing and we don't have to have conditionals or anything like that within our loop. So let me go ahead and run this script and we'll end up with the same result here for y. Great. The next thing we're gonna do is look at how to analyze this processing that's taking place. Right now, we can sort of hear that there's a boost in the low frequencies cut in the high frequencies, but how do we figure out what's happening for this whole uh, kind of spectral processing, this whole filter? So instead of using noise as our input signal, I'm gonna switch over and use a different input signal temporarily. So I'll go in here and let's change this and I'll have a different input signal and we're going to use an impulse so we can measure the impulse response of this processing. So this impulse is a special signal, it's X, the first value is gonna be a one, then the other values are gonna be zero. Now I know in this case, I'm just gonna add some extra zeros here to give us some room to work. We'll look at how many of these we actually need to end up using in the end. So right now, N is equal to uh, five. It's our total number of samples. Everything else should be great. We'll be able to process this and look at the result. So down here, instead of listening to that, what I'm gonna do is print this to the command window. Impulse response. So that means the output of our processing due to, or the response due to the uh, input, that's an impulse, X. So let's print out Y to the command window and look at the result. See if it confirms what we would guess. So down here we see that the impulse response is one, one, and then we have a bunch of zeros after that. And in fact, no matter how many zeros we had in our input, we'd have that many in our output. So really our impulse response is this first, uh, the first two samples. We got a one and a one. Now why is this? When we think about our processing, we're gonna put a one into this uh, element, so, and we'll have a zero to begin with. So one plus zero is equal to one, and then we store that value of one in our previous sample. The next time through, we have a second sample is equal to zero. Now we're gonna do zero plus one, and that gives us one. And then we're gonna store a value of zero in here. So we have zero plus zero for all the other ones. So really our impulse response comes down to one and one. So let's even hard code this in and say X is equal to one and one. Now, if I go back through and say we're gonna work with our input signal that's white noise, we can process it by using the convolution function in MATLAB. So CONV, we put in X and H, we can assign this to Y. It will process the whole arrays and give us a new array Y. This is why the impulse response is so powerful. We don't need to set up all these loops and do all this kind of stuff. If we know what the impulse response is of our system, then what we can do is perform this kind of processing with convolution, our, our input signal, our system, and now we get the uh, output. So let me switch this back. 
and uh, let's use white noise as our input. We want, I'll even comment out this set of code because we're not using it anymore. We're just performing the processing here and we can listen to the output, Y and FS. So we're setting up, we've got the noise, we've got the sampling rate, all that kind of stuff. Previous sample is not used anymore. Here's our impulse response and let's listen to the result. So now that we have our impulse response, we can use some things built into MATLAB to help us understand how it's actually going to work. There's a special function that we can use called FreakZ. So it's F-R-E-Q-Z. I come down here, I can type in FreakZ, and it tells us what it's going to do is perform this uh, frequency response of a digital filter. And we'll get back to more of the complicated things about it, but we know that the main purpose of it is to calculate this frequency response of the digital filter. So the basic use of this function is that we can put in our impulse response H. So if I come down here and I type in FREQZ, and then I put in H, this is going to do is pop up a plot. So think of it as another type of plotting function. So just like we have plot and stem, freak Z is going to plot something in a figure window, but it's going to plot for us the frequency response of our system. So I can put our impulse response in here, run the script and look at the result. So here is the impulse response of our system. This is going to be a low pass filter that we created. So an impulse response of one, one, it's going to give us this kind of spectral shape. Down here in the lower frequencies on our magnitude response, we're gonna see that it actually increases the amplitude of low frequencies. If I drag this cursor over, what this ends up doing is actually creating a six dB increase to the amplitude of low frequencies. We'll come back to that in a second. As we go up in our spectrum to higher and higher frequencies, it ends up rolling off the amplitude so that way up here at our high frequencies, the amplitude gets reduced by a really large amount. Another thing that I'll point out here is our spectrum is plotted over normalized frequencies. This is going to be relative to our Nyquist frequency. So down here we have low frequencies like DC or maybe even like 20 Hertz in this range. Up here we have our Nyquist frequency. If our sampling rate is 48,000, this represents how our frequency of 24,000 is going to be processed. So any frequency along the way, let's say half of 24,000 is 12,000. We can come up here and look and say, all right, at half of 24,000, that's going to be 12,000. This has a gain of uh, 3 dB. Down here in the bottom, what we see is the phase response. We'll cover the phase response and what happens uh, later on in some other videos. For now, let's just focus on the magnitude or what's also sometimes called the amplitude response. So this is our low pass filter. Now, typically for these kinds of uh, filters that we could create in audio, we don't necessarily want this uh, pass band up here to be increasing the amplitude, right? It's a six dB increase that's happening at the low frequencies. We usually want our low pass filters to have unity gain of zero up here in the pass band and then just reduce the amplitude from there. So one thing we can do is actually scale the relative amplitude uh, of that pass band or of our impulse response. So if I come over here, and instead of having one and one, if we want to reduce this by six dB, we can multiply it by 0 0.5. Can run the script. And now what we see is we have reduced the amplitude of the whole filter by 6 dB. So over here now at low frequencies, we have a pass band gain of zero. So that's great. This is more of a conventional kind of low pass filter that we want to use with audio. Has that great kind of uh, behavior. And we could look for, all right, where's our 3 dB down frequency and 6 dB down frequency and all that kind of stuff. So. That's the basics of setting up the low pass filter. There's another thing that I want to demonstrate then about uh, working with the low pass filter. What we can do is look at the relative amplitude of these different paths. So here on our impulse response, this gain of one 
that represents the gain on our dry path. Then the second one, that represents the gain on our delayed path or the uh, gain in front of the previous sample. So in this case, when we set up the loop, we weren't changing the relative amplitude of these things. But if I were to change this to maybe like 0.5 instead, and I run the script again, what ends up doing happening is it changes this relative shape of our low pass filter. So now it's not cutting the amplitude of high frequencies as much. And really this gain is something, it's a parameter that we can adjust. So if I increase this closer to one, like to 0.9, right, we can see that it increases the slope or this uh, shape that we have for the roll off of our filter, right, to 9.5, like this. As I increase it more and more, we're getting more roll off that ends up happening. If I decrease it, like let's say 0.3, we run it, right? We don't get a very sharp filter. It's more of just kind of flattening things out. Our range here is just going from, you know, a few dB down to 10 dB down, right? And if I were to get rid of this whole thing and just have it be 0, 0.0, that's essentially the same thing as uh, just passing the dry signal through, right? We see that there's no spectral shaping that's happening. We just have unity gain when we just have that dry amplitude that goes through. But for the more complete version here, we could have a 0 0.5 and we would have one and one. What this is gonna do is give us the maximum amount of destructive interference for high frequencies. This is where they're gonna, the amplitude is going to completely cancel out. As we decrease the amplitude of this one, what we're doing is reducing how much we're canceling out the high frequencies. It's another way to think about it. So the final thing that I'll show is uh, rather than having this gain term of 0 0.5 out front, what we could do is actually have it be inside of our impulse response and be 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. Gives us the same exact thing, right? That gain multiplier out front could be distributed into our array and we'd end up with the same exact filtering. So if we take this impulse response and we go back through to what we had in our loop, we revisit what we had before in our loop, what we would want to do in terms of this processing is actually have this uh, 0 0.5 multiplied by our input signal here, X, and a 0 0.5 multiplied by our previous sample. This gives us a low pass filter with unity gain, right? We have the 0 0.5 multiplied by both terms. Again, this is kind of up to you as a programmer to decide how you want to do this. If you want to make use of these uh, things in algebra where you can pull it out or distribute it through, you could have this gain of 0 0.5 applied to both of these things together. It's an equivalent uh, result of processing. So what we've seen now is that this form of uh, processing where we take the current sample and add it with a previous sample, this shows us that uh, this basic filter is actually equal to a low pass filter. Simplest kind of spectral processor where we let the low frequencies pass through and cut the amplitude of the high frequencies. What we're going to do is move on into our next videos and look at how we can create other kinds of filters that have different types of frequency responses.